In this video, we'll examine the transverse displacement of a beam. We will assume that this is an Euler-Bernoulli beam, which amongst other things means we can ignore shearing effects and also the rotatory inertia of the beam. We'll call the transverse displacement W, which in general is a function of both X and T. And across the beam, or along the length of the beam, is some applied load, load per unit length, which we'll call lowercase f of x and t. My x-axis runs axially along the beam, and the z-axis is transverse to the beam. I've taken a slice, a differential slice of length dx, and I've reproduced it here to the right. By cutting it away, we need to add the forces on the free body diagram. On the left-hand side, we have a shearing force upwards, V. On the right-hand side, the force is V plus dV. And similarly, we have a moment on the left we call M, and a moment on the right, M plus dM. And along the length of this differential element is the distributed load F. We'll begin by applying Newton's second law to this differential element. So just F equals MA. We'll call this the force equation. Oops. And that's just F equals MA. So the mass is rho times the cross-sectional area, A of X, times the length, which is DX, times the acceleration, which would be d squared w of xt divided by dt squared. And that's equal to the sum of the forces. So we have a force v of x of t. In fact, you know what? I'm just going to leave out the x and t for now, just to make it a little bit more brief. But um, v is, it should be assumed to be a function of x of t. On the left-hand side, it's V upwards. We're going to subtract on the right-hand side V plus dV. And that we need to add the force, the distributed load. So that's plus F XT times the length, since F is a force per unit length. And we'll call that equation 1. Uh, let me just change colors. The Vs will cancel. Okay. The second equation is a moment balance. Now, we know there's no rotatory acceleration. That's part of the Euler-Bernoulli assumption that says that the beam remains parallel. The cross-sections of the beam remain parallel to one another. Um, so what we do is we say that the moment, let's just assume for now that counterclockwise is positive. So we'll say that M plus DM minus M. Um, the shear force doesn't contribute to the moment. I should have mentioned we're going to do the moment about point O, which is the left-hand side. So this shear force Vx of T on the left doesn't contribute at all to the moment. But on the one on the right certainly does, and that has a negative contribution. So we've got to say minus um, V plus DV. And what is the moment arm? It's this length here, which is DX. And then we need to include the effect of the distributed load. So that would be a positive moment. F XT times DX gives us the force. And then the moment arm, we can assume the force acts through the middle of the element. So the moment arm is just dx divided by 2. And that's equal to 0. Why is it 0? That's part of the Euler-Bernoulli assumption. There is no rotation of that element. Call that equation 2. Now, we also know from calculus that we can write dv is just partial v, partial x, times dx, call that equation 3. And similarly, dm is just equal to partial m divided by partial x times dx, call that equation 4. So if we take equation 3 and apply it to equation 1, equation 1 becomes uh, rho a of x, this remains unchanged, 
d squared w, x and t, by dt squared, okay, minus dv, or sorry, is equal to minus dv, which is partial v, partial x, times dx, plus f of xt, dx. And obviously the dx's will cancel here. I left out the dx on the right. I mean on the left. This dx is that dx. So the dx's cancel. Okay. Now by applying 3 and 4 to equation 2, 3 and 4 substituted into equation 2, we get the following, that, um, well, the m's cancel. So dm is equal to partial m, partial x, times dx, okay, minus v, minus d, excuse me, minus v dx. I'm just going to multiply it out. Minus dv, which is partial v, partial x, times dx times dx again, so that would be dx squared, plus f of x comma t, dx squared over 2. Now, on the basis that dx is a differential size, it's infinitesimal, dx squared relative to dx is negligible. So these two terms are approximately equal to 0. We can just cancel them. And then we can actually just divide each of those by dx. And this is equal to zero, by the way. Let me do that in black, rather. So rewriting this, we find that um, v is equal to dm of t times dx. We'll call this equation 6. Okay, and um, I left out equation 5 over here. All right, so the idea is we can now use equation 6. We can substitute that into equation 5 to simplify that one. Uh, let me write that. So if we take equation 6, we substitute it into equation 5. We end up with the following. Rho A of X D squared W of XT divided by DT squared is equal to uh, minus, how do I want to write this? d squared m of xt divided by dx squared. So all I did here is I took um, this minus dv dx, I substituted v into there, and we ended up with d squared m dx squared. Okay, and then I need to put plus f. f of x of t, I'll put it. We'll call this equation 7. Okay. Now, one of the assumptions that comes along with the euler bernoulli beam assumption, in other words, because this is an euler bernoulli beam, we know that the moment m x of t can be found by e i the flexural rigidity of the beam, times d squared w of x and t, divided by, whoops, divided by dx squared. So we'll go ahead and substitute equation 8 into equation 7. And we can write that then as rho a of x times d squared 
W, X and T, by D, T squared, is equal to minus D squared by D, X squared, of E, I, of X, D squared W, of X and T, divided by D, X squared, do it on the next line, plus F of X, T. That's equation nine. Now that is the beam equation in its most general form. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna further simplifying it, f simplify it by assuming that this is a uniform beam. So it means that none of the properties, the geometric or material properties vary uh, along the X direction. So we'll write that for a uniform beam. Whoops. We can then write rho times a, which is no longer a function of x, times d squared w, x and t, divided by dt squared. And I'm going to bring this term to the other side, so it becomes plus d squared, oh, excuse me, plus ei d four W X T by D X four is equal to F of X comma T. That we'll call equation 10. So that is the equation for transverse displacements of the uniform beam. Uh, in order to go about solving it, we can first look at the free vibration problem. So free vibrations. And this means that the force would be zero. And I'm going to use some shorthand here. Let me write it and I explain it as I go. C squared times W comma X, 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 which means the derivative of W with respect to X. That's what the comma means. And they're four X's. So it's the fourth derivative of W with respect to X. I'm dropping the X and T dependency just for shorthand, plus W double dot, second time derivative of W is equal to zero. And C squared, we've just defined as EI divided by rho A. We'll call this equation 11. Let's move on to the next page. So let me just rewrite that equation from the previous page for free vibrations. Um, we said that C squared W comma X, 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 X plus W double dot is equal to zero where c squared is equal to ei divided by rho a. All right, so we apply the separation of variables technique, like we've seen previously, where we assume that w of x comma t is equal to some function w, I'll call it capital W, of x times some function capital T of t. So we're assuming that we can split the x and time dependent part. And by the way, since my w's look the same, the small w and capital W, I'm putting these little crossbars on the top of it to signify capital W. When you see that, it's a function of x only. All right, um, this was equation 11. So this would be equation, well, We'll just substitute this into equation 11. What happens is we get C squared W, that's capital W, comma X, 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 X times T, which is not a function of X, so we don't differentiate it. Um, 
Maybe I should just put that in to make it clear. Plus W double dot. So W does not get differentiated. And the T, we take a double dot there. And that's equal to zero. So we can rewrite this as, how do we want to do this? C squared W comma X, 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 X divided by W is equal to negative T double dot divided by T. And the idea is if we've got one function, which is a function of X and another function that's a function of T, and they're equal all the time, they must both be constant. And we're going to call this constant omega squared. Why? I'm going to show you in a second why we called it omega squared. But omega squared is the natural frequency squared. Omega being the natural frequency. Um, so now we can treat each of these separately. We can take this equation equal to omega squared and separate it from this equation. That's why it's called the separation of variables method. So let's first start off, well, I guess we'll write them both. So we can say that um, w comma x, 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 x minus, I left out my c squared, minus omega squared times w is equal to zero. Call that 13. And also we can say that uh, t double dot minus or plus in this case omega squared t equals zero. Call that equation 14. Now, equation 14, you should recognize. That is just the equation for simple harmonic motion. It's the same equation we had for the simple harmonic oscillator, where in that case, the t's were x's, x double dot and x, and the omega squared was k over m, where k was the spring stiffness and m was the mass. Okay, so the solution to 14 is known. Solution to 14 is known should be very familiar with that at this point, and that is that t of t is equal to c1 times cosine omega t plus c2 sine of omega t. Call that 15. The initial conditions in this case, say ICs, are uh, that at time equals zero, W of X zero, the displacement field is known. We'll call that W sub zero, which is a function of X. And also we know the velocity. So W dot at X comma zero is equal to W dot zero which is also a function of x. We'll call that, um, we'll call these 16 and 17. Um, I'm realizing I wanted to number this. We'll call this 12 and I'll get rid of this. We don't need to call that 12. Um, just a slight digression here. You might remember from the multi-degree of freedom system, what we did is we found out that the displacement x was equal to some vector, which was the vector of mode shapes, times sine omega t plus phi. And it was only after that that we substituted the initial conditions. In a similar manner, we're not going to substitute the initial conditions until right at the very end. It's the last thing that you do. The next thing that we need to do is we need to solve the x equation, or the W equation for X, I should say. And you might have guessed that this will give rise to the mode shapes. Only unlike the N degree of freedom system when there were N mode shapes, this is really an infinite degree of freedom system. 
So there are actually an infinite number of mode shapes. So I'm just giving you a little heads up as to what's to come. But we first got to figure out what the mode shapes are. Then we plug this back into equation 12. And then we can apply the initial conditions. Okay, so let's continue. Um, we'll take the equation we had, w comma x, 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 x. Minus... I'm going to call this, hmm, well, let's just leave it for now as uh, omega squared over c squared. Is equal to zero. Oops, I left up my w. w is equal to zero. And as we've done previously, we assume the solution is w of x is equal to some constant times e to the rx. All right. We'll call this 18. And when we substitute 18 into that, we get r to the 4 equals omega over c quantity squared. Okay. In other words, when I take the fourth derivative of this, I end up with r to the 4 e to the rx. Um, the e to the rx is cancel, and then I'm left with r4 equals w over c squared. Now, in order to simplify this a little, I'm going to define beta such that beta to the fourth is equal to omega divided by c squared. This implies that r, r to the 4 equals beta to the 4. Okay. Um, taking the square root, this means that r squared is equal to plus or minus beta squared. Now, if beta is positive, then r 1 and 2, the first two roots, are equal to plus and minus beta. And if beta if uh, beta is negative, then roots three and four, the next two roots, are equal to plus or minus beta times i, where i is the square root of minus one. So either the roots are real, plus and minus real roots, or plus and minus imaginary roots. We'll call this. 19 and 20. Okay, so what we need to do now is rewrite w in the form w of x is equal to, and I'm going to use d1 because these are different constants from the c. So d1 e to the beta x plus d2e to the minus beta x, plus d3e to the i beta x, plus d4e to the minus i beta x. Now you might remember from before, this quantity can be written as sines and cosines. We're using Euler's law to get there. What about these two? Do you remember what they can be done with uh, exponentials? The answer is we can rewrite those as the hyperbolic sine and cosine functions. So I'll rewrite this as d1 times cosh beta x plus d2 cinch hyperbolic sine beta x plus d3 cosine beta x plus d4 sine beta x. We make use of Euler's law to convert that to sine and cosine. And let me just do this in a different color to keep it clear. Um, the definitions of cinch and cosh are such that cinch x is equal to e to the x minus e to the minus x 
divided by 2 and cos of x is equal to e to the x plus e to the minus x divided by 2. Um, I just want to point out that these d's are not the same. They're different, but I didn't want to change variable again. It will only lead to the confusion. Um, but still, these are all constants, but they're actually different constants from those ones, despite the fact that they're all named d. Okay. And let me also rewrite. We, we know from above that uh, beta 4 is equal to omega divided by c quantity squared. This implies omega, the angular frequency of each mode, can be found by c times beta squared, which is equal to square root of e i divided by rho a times beta squared. This will come in handy a little bit later. Uh, 19, 20, we'll call this 21. Uh, we'll call this 22. We'll call this one 23. Okay, let's turn the page. So the last thing that remains to be done is to talk about the boundary conditions. This is a fourth order differential equation in X. So therefore it requires four boundary conditions or two boundary conditions at each end. So let's just write that. Four boundary conditions are required. This implies two BCs at each end. And by B each end, I mean at x equals zero and x equals L. Okay. One of the boundary conditions is something called the free edge. This uh, literally means nothing is applied at the edge. And as a result, there are no tractions. It's a traction-free surface. So what that means is there's no moment. The moment is equal to zero. But we know that the moment is equal to e i w comma x x equals zero. This implies that capital W of x comma x x is equal to zero. Similarly, the free edge will have no shear applied. V is equal to zero. This implies that d by dx, shear is just the derivative of the moment, so d by dx of e i w comma x x is equal to zero. Or for a uniform beam, we can say that w comma x x x is equal to zero. Let me write that uniform beam. Okay, the idea is if it's uniform, the ei is not a function of x and can come outside of the derivative. So that's the free edge. The next condition to look at is something called a pinned edge. also known as simply supported. And a pinned edge looks something like this. You've got the end of the beam and you've got a pin in there. So it can't displace, but it can rotate. So what happens is we say that this implies that W is equal to zero, which means that capital W is equal to zero. Um, let me just give these some numbers. 25, I think we were up to. Just check that. 24. 24. This here would be 25. This would be 26. Okay. 
And the other thing is similar to a free edge, a pin joint can't support a moment. So we also know that for a pin joint, the moment is equal to zero. This implies that E I W comma X X equals zero, which further implies that capital W comma X X is equal to zero. We'll call that 27. Um, and the third boundary condition is something that's called a clamped edge. Sometimes also called a built-in edge. And just to draw a diagram, this would look something like this, like the, the end of a cantilevered beam. And the idea is this cannot displace, but also the slope right here has got to be zero. The slope can't change. So translating that into math means that W at that edge is equal to zero. This implies that capital W must be equal to zero. Call that 28. And furthermore, the slope is zero. So W comma X, the first derivative is equal to zero. This implies that capital W comma X is equal to zero. Call that 29. Now these three tend to be the most common boundary conditions that one comes across uh, in most engineering problems. Uh, in reality, there might be all sorts of different exotic boundary conditions. To give you an example, maybe at the end you have a mass. Or maybe at the end you have a spring. Or a combination of those. Or maybe at the end you have some sort of a torsional spring. Okay, We're going to ignore those for now. You'd rather just keep it simple. And I think I'm going to cut the video off at this point because it's getting kind of long. But what I'm going to do in the next video is I'm going to work the example of the simply supported beam. So the beam that is pinned at both ends. And I'm going to show you how we come up with the equations of motion for that. So I hope you found something useful in this video. If you have, please give us a thumbs up so that others can get to see it or leave us some comments below. Thank you for watching and we'll catch up with you in the next video.